Hello, I'm Alec Avdokov, and welcome to the life and times of Frederick the Great. I would like to thank you for your patience in waiting for me to produce my next episode. Recently, I took the latter half of the week to watch the Memorial Golf Tournament with my dad. I had a wonderful time with him, and now I'm trying to get back to a more regular schedule. Remember that any money donated to listener support will go straight to help Ukraine. I'm also still donating half of my advertisement money to help Ukrainians. Hopefully, the people who are caught up in this terrible conflict can be helped with your support. Also, please give me honest feedback and reviews from wherever you listen. I seriously cannot thank you all enough for the support you have given me. Once again, I apologize for uploading my episode so late. Anyway, let's get to the crux of the matter. So if I'm going to be completely honest, I had a bit of trouble trying to figure out what this week's episode should be about. I just decided that instead of going fully into the military situation of the First Silesian War, I would instead have a quick look at the alliances that were shaping after Frederick's victorious first battle. So, let me first give an after-action report of the Battle of Molwitz and discuss the fallout with the political situation in Europe after that fateful day in the spring of 1741. So, let me give a brief overview of what happened during the last episode on the military front. So after the extremely successful invasion of Silesia in the winter of 1740, Frederick had a debate with his second-in-command, Field Marshal Schwerin, about where to deploy the troops. Frederick wanted to deploy the troops north, while Schwerin wanted to deploy the army south near the border of Bohemia. It was decided that the army would deploy itself south along the border. This then allowed the Austrian Field Marshal Neitberg to invade Silesia, because the Prussians were spread thin. This cut Frederick off from his line of communications to Berlin and forced a battle near the village of Molwitz. After at this battle, Frederick's army deployed slowly in the snow and the Austrians were the first to make a move by advancing their left wing cavalry on the Prussian right wing. Frederick, being in the thick of the fighting on the Prussian right, had to flee the fight or be captured. Field Marshal Schwerin took command of the Prussian army restored order in the ranks, and ordered an advance against the Austrian infantry line. The Prussian infantry advanced like moving walls as they caused the Austrians to break and flee from the field of battle. Therefore, even though Frederick ran away from the battle, the Prussian army won the day. The future famous military theorist and Prussian general Karl von Clausewitz later noted that the Prussian infantry was at, quote, a level of perfection in the use of firepower that has still not been perpassed. Striking praise, but perhaps not an untrue hyperbole. However, let's talk about the actual subject of this podcast and his perspective on the battle. Frederick the Great had fought bravely during the time he was at the battle, but he fled midway through. He rode away from the battle in an extremely fast gray horse that would be nicknamed the Molvitz Gray, as I said in the last episode. Fun fact about the horse that Frederick wrote on that day with the small spoiler alert. The Molvitz Gray would actually live into old age after the war and would occasionally be ridden in military parades. He would eventually die in 1762, aged 40, after a very full life for a horse. But anyway, back to Frederick's ride from the Battle of Molvitz. See, Frederick was scared that if the Austrians captured him, they would treat him like a puppet on a string, controlling his every move. No, the strong-willed Frederick would never allow this to happen. He would ride from the battle as the chaos on the right wing of the army ensued. Frederick's plan was to ride to the town of Old Penn, which he believed would be safe. Little did he know that an Austrian cavalry detachment had already captured the town. When Frederick arrived outside the town, the Austrian garrison began firing at him. Frederick rode back to the battlefield of his sheer embarrassment and would not be found until the morning after on April 11th. There were so many myths that sprung out from this, ep- from this episode. There was one story that said that an Austrian horseman from the middle of nowhere approached Frederick, raised his sword, and Frederick yelled, Let me go, and I'll reward you. 
The Austrian replied to him, saying, "Right after the war." Of course, this is not true in the slightest, but those were the times. History and myth back then were on a fairly thin line. David Fraser's biography of Frederick the Great discusses the flaws of his command during this first battle. He writes, quote, "He had been determined that he and he alone should command. He earlier rejected suggestions that the old Dessauer." Who had been skeptical about the whole Silesian adventure should accompany his suite, saying that the King of Prussia must not be seen going to war with a tutor. Now the absence of a tutor seemed most unfortunate. So overall, Frederick's command was fairly unskilled during his first battle. Frederick would personally take the blame in private, but publicly he blamed the weight of numbers against him. In the last episode. I said that Frederick wrote about how he was outnumbered in the battle by six thousand men, despite the fact that he was likely outnumbered the Austrians. I really like the quote that Tim Blanning wrote regarding the political aftermath of the Battle of Mollwitz. He wrote, quote, "In the shorter term, Mollwitz precipitated a chain of events that was to unleash the war of Austrian succession on the world." If the Austrians had won and expelled Frederick from Silesia, they might well have deterred other potential predators. In the event, their fragility brought a flock of vultures flapping down. The victory of Frederick, with the small twenty thousand men army, managed to prove to the rest of Europe that Prussia would be a name Europe would not soon forget. What happened next would be a spectacle of diplomacy that ranks near the top. If you are a fan of the double dealing, the backstabbing that diplomacy is absolutely famous for. Sadly, I do not have all the details, but I will do my best to tell them in a way that makes sense to the average listener. I'll start with Prussia's perspective on this series of events. So Prussia had a very simple goal throughout the First Silesian War. Frederick wanted to keep Silesia and the County of Glatz. As I said previously, Silesia is an extremely wealthy and populous province during this time, and would double the population of Prussia if it were incorporated into the kingdom. Frederick mainly wanted international recogn recognition that Silesia is a Prussian province. The Habsburgs wanted to regain Silesia to keep the territorial integrity of the empire. France had more complicated objectives in this war. France wanted to be sure that the husband of Maria Theresa would not be the next Holy Roman Emperor. If Maria Theresa's husband, Francis of Lorraine, became the next emperor, then it would complicate France's claim on the Duchy of Lorraine. After all, in the War of Polish Succession, one of the contestants for the Polish king was Stanislaus Lijinsky, who was the ruler of the Duchy of Lorraine, and it was supposed to pass to France after his death. If Francis of Lorraine became the Holy Roman Emperor, Then Lorraine might become Habsburg again, and France can't have that, can they? At first, France was extremely hesitant to ally with Prussia. I mean, what can a poor little kingdom like Prussia do against the entire might of the rich Habsburg Empire? Af However, after Prussia won in Mollwitz on April 10, 1741, France was more willing to talk about alliances. The main guy for foreign policy in France at that time. Was Cardinal Fleury, who was almost ninety in 1741, an eighty-eight-year-old in charge of the most powerful state in Europe's foreign diplomacy. I can't see anything wrong with that. There is no way the French kingdom will fall into ruin ever. Anyway, I can't keep alluding to 1789. That's too obvious. Now that I brought up the French, I have to bring the British into the fray. Britain had been a natural ally of Austria because they both wanted to halt French expansion on the continent. However, as of now, Britain was neutral, and Frederick hoped that Britain could bring peace between Prussia and Austria. The Prussian Minister of State Podwils believed that there could be a possible agreement made with the British, but Frederick wrote that the Prussian and French interests in the war were identical. All right. We've talked about Prussian, Austrian, French, and British aims for the upcoming war, but there are still two small players that we need to discuss to get the full picture: Bavaria and Saxony. 
See, Elector Charles Albert wanted to become the next Holy Roman Emperor, and he wanted to be elevated to the throne of Bohemia. Saxony, whose ruler was Augustus III, wanted to connect its Saxon holdings with its Polish holdings. Specifically, the territory they wanted was Moravia and Upper Silesia, the same Upper Silesia that Frederick now occupied. I will now go more into the specifics of what happened now that we have the different and competing goals of the soon-to-be combatants. After many talks between the French and the Prussians, an alliance was signed between them in Breslau on June 4, 1741. According to David Fraser's biography of Frederick the Great, Frederick was still uneasy about his alliance with France. David Fraser wrote, quote, The new alliance indicated further complications and commitments. France was now supporting the elector of Bavaria's claim to the throne of Bohemia, as well as his candidacy for the imperial crown. And Frederick, who had also agreed to, the, to support the Bavarian candidacy and had indeed suggested it, was unenthusiastic about a greatly expanded and strengthened Bavaria with Bohemia across the southern border. Frederick also had to give up his claims in the duchies of Ulic and Berg. But Frederick's main gripe with an alliance with Bavaria and France was not necessarily the competing claims, but more so the fact that he did not think France and Bavaria could succeed in a prolonged war against Austria. Prussia certainly could not fight alone against Austria, but there seemed to be very little energy behind France's and Bavaria's military. Frederick knew that he would eventually have to again fight on the field of battle in order to make sure that his military had a decisive advantage against Austria. France and Bavaria's military had one shot to knock Austria out of the war. Frederick believed that France and Bavaria must pursue a swift military campaign down the Danube and straight into the heart of the Habsburg Empire with the ultimate goal of capturing Vienna. Frederick, underlying the urgency of all of this, wrote to a letter to France's chief minister, Cardinal Fleury, in which Frederick wrote, quote, If the cardinal does not want to make war, he ought to give up the alliance. David Fraser compares this letter to Stalin impatiently waiting for an allied invasion of France to set a second front in Europe in World War II, which, I mean, isn't entirely wrong, but did he have to compare Frederick with Stalin? Now that we are talking about possible military plans for an invasion of Austria, let me finish up this week's episode by discussing the military situation after the Battle of Molwitz. So, Ten days after the battle, on April 20th, 1741, Voltaire wrote Frederick a letter in which he compares Frederick to great conquerors such as Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden, Charles the Swelt of Sweden, and Achilles, all of whom did win great battles, but ended up dying in battle and did not see their plans come to fruition. So honestly, that was a fairly backhanded blow from Voltaire, even though it was dressed in fine words. On May 4th, 1741, the fortress of Brig on the Oder was stormed and captured by Prussian forces less than a month after the Battle of Molwitz. However, Brig was pretty much up for the taking as it had only one cannon made out of leather and was abandoned by the Swedish army a century before. But besides that fortress being captured, the overall strategic situation in Silesia had not changed. Prussia was still in de facto control of Silesia, while the Austrians were creating an army in Bohemia to drive the, uh, the Prussians out. There were a few cavalry skirmishes as spring transitioned into summer, including one at Rothschloss. In this skirmish, a Prussian officer, Hans Joachim von Zieten, commanded a force that was outnumbered by the Austrians, and yet the Prussian cavalry prevailed. This cavalryman, will play a major role in the upcoming wars and will help reform Prussia's cavalry to become more elite. That was the main military engagement during this time period, but there were different developments taking place throughout the summer. Nysa, a fortress town in the very south of Silesia, was still controlled by the Austrians, while the Austrians were building strength south of Silesia in Moravia. However, Frederick was not just sitting on his hands during this time. 
He signed an alliance with France and Bavaria in June of 1741, as I already stated. Simultaneously, he began constructing a, a magazine in the town of Schweidnitz. A military magazine is where ammunition, weapons, and guns are stored, so a modern equivalent would be a military supply depot. Frederick also made liberal reforms in Silesia, such as equal rights between Catholics and Protestants, the creation of a modern bureaucracy, and reformed the judicial system so that non-nobles could become judges. He also appointed the Archbishop uh, Bishop of Breslau, despite the fact that the Pope should have been the one who did that. That reminds me of an old Stalin quote in which he said, quote, The Pope? How many divisions does he have? Essentially saying that the Pope was no match for his vast army of millions. Dang it, did I just compare Frederick to Stalin? I'm such a hypocrite. Anyway, both of them did have contempt for religion and were powerful leaders that started wars, so maybe they have some similarities. To round out this week's episode, I will discuss three last developments that took place in the summer and fall of 1741. The first thing that happened in June 1741 was when Maria Theresa was crowned the King of Hungary in what is today Bratislava, Slovakia, but was then called Pressburg. That's right, women can be kings too. During the ceremony, the nobles of Hungary promised to raise 40,000 troops against the foes of the Habsburg Empire. They ended up raising only 20,000. The second development was that Britain, despite the schemes to attack Prussia with the forces of Saxony, Hanover, Bavar Britain, and perhaps even Russia, declared their neutrality in this confused fight. While there were sympathies to help fight uh, with Austria against the French, the British government did not want to shed the blood and treasure in a fight that didn't seem to be theirs. The final development will be on the military front. A Colonel von Goltz wrote to the British envoy in Berlin secretly that Field Marshal Neitberg could retreat into Moravia without Prussian meddling, and in exchange, the fortress of Nysa would be put under siege for a period of 14 days before the fortress would surrender. He wrote, all of this must take place secretly, or else the deal would be off. We shall see next week what will happen to that plan made by von Goltz. So yeah, that is where I will leave you. With a mainly quiet military front and an absolutely dizzying negotiations on the diplomatic front with an alliance made between Prussia, Austria, and Bavaria. To conclude this week, I believe I shall say to you, see you later, folks.